Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Sanders. I am the CICMQ uh, head of. Um, I always get it around the wrong way. Um, uh, welcome to uh, the, uh, the the next version of the All About You. Uh, this is a health and well-being session. Really pleased that today we've got a chap called Drew Povey with me and with us, um, as well as Tim Lodge. I'm um, talking about the power of uncertainty, and uh, that's a sufficiently vague enough to be intriguing. So um, I'm really really looking forward to this session. Thank you so much for joining us, Drew. Um, um, I will hand over to you now. I shall share my screen. Thank you, Tim. If anybody wants to um, uh, put a chat in there, questions or whatever, please do. Um, please, please add a chat in um, and uh, we'll pick it up as we go through. So good morning, everyone. Um, Tim Lodge, uh, para canoe athlete and owner of Zenval Limited. Um, it's great to speak to you all again this morning. Uh, the last one we did was on health and well-being and as Chris mentioned earlier on there's some um, stuff that we're going to talk about later about how you've all been going on since that that first presentation and I understand you've had some really interesting presentations between now and then so I'm pleased to be joined today by Drew Povey um, who is a friend and colleague of mine that I met um, a little while back and we've been working together ever since I'm going to talk a little bit about how we met later on in the presentation, but the way that it's gonna to work uh, today is similar to the last one. Um, I'm not a uh, qualified psychologist or expert by any means in these matters, but the way that I present my work is based around my life experience of certain situations relating to physical and mental wellbeing. And the title of the one today is, is really the power of uncertainty. And Drew and I have done this before to businesses where we really talk about the, um, the power of uncertainty in the world that we're in, you know, the world that we're living in at the moment in this pandemic specifically. So I'm gonna talk for about 10 minutes, run you through some slides on my experience, um, my experiences of dealing with uncertainty. And then Drew's gonna speak um, a little bit more. Um, Drew will be sharing a more interactive session with you where he puts some stuff on his whiteboard and talks through different situations and he'll basically be asking you to comment throughout that as well um, in the chat box. Similarly with mine, if there's any points that you're interested in, then please just put in the chat box and we'll, we'll pick them up at the end. Um, so moving through onto my presentation, um, living in a certain environment, can enable transformation and change. Can I just ask all of you just to go on mute for me while we're, while we're speaking? That would be great, thank you. Um, so living in an uncertain environment can enable transformation and change. And that's something that we've certainly all been faced with this year. Um, my experience is it, of it has um, been from complete change of being in a position where I was heading into a Paralympic trial to go to Tokyo Paralympics in September and then really the last four years has been leading up to that point and then the rug being pulled away and the games being postponed. So we're gonna talk you through a bit about that. But before I got to the year 2020, there were a lot of um, areas of my life that were very uncertain. And I'm just gonna talk you through some of those over the next few screens. So as you know, I'm a Paralympic athlete. I have been for about eight years. The first four years of that journey, I was solely focused on getting to the Rio Paralympics in 2016. Um, I'd come, as you know, from being a sales director uh, to start to become an athlete in 2013. So I had just over three years of preparation prior to my selection for the Rio Games. Um, for somebody that, if I'm perfectly honest, and you'd have heard from some of the talks that I've done, had issues around um, self-confidence, um, self-worth. Um, I lived in my mind a lot. I dealt with a lot of anxiety and, and depression, as, as people call it. And really to go from the um, environment where I was, which was a sort of successful sales director that was always life and soul of every deal and every party that I ever went to, to... So once that life stopped for me, I was left with really just myself and my canoe and to put myself into, I probably couldn't have put myself into a more uncertain environment than the environment of a high performing athlete. Um, and I've learned a tremendous amount about 
dealing with uncertainty within that journey. And the first part of that was really focusing up to Rio. The picture that you see in front of you there was where I attended a, a pre-games training camp where we were, um, the podium potential athletes from Great Britain were invited to go to Rio for three weeks to train prior to the Paralympics. And because it was such a huge change for me, everywhere that I went, everybody was saying, have you been selected for Rio yet, Logi? How's it going for Rio? It was Rio, 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 everywhere I went for the first three years. And in my mind, that was the end goal. That was the outcome for me. That was what would make me. That was what would make me happy. That was what would complete me. All of these things, I put so much onus on this, this end goal, this, this, this focusing of this goal, which certainly helped with my training, but Day to day, I felt that I'd put too much onus on that. And therefore, when I was racing, I was really more worried about the outcome of that race rather than the actual race itself and how I was delivering that race. And I learned a tremendous amount in that first cycle about, um, about dealing and working in that in, you know, uncertain environment. The biggest part of my, my athlete life, if you like, or the, the crescendo or the, the part where the outcome occurs is, is race day. Um, the event that I race is a 200 meter sprint event. So it lasts about 40 seconds. The boat goes into a start bucket that comes out of the water. The boat stops, ready, set, and then the, 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 um, the gate drops and off you go. And that, that picture is about 10 minutes into a race. Um, we do about 148 strokes a minute um, and I get the boat up to top speed, which is about 22 kilometers an hour in about 40 minutes. So as you can imagine, the pressure and the uncertainty is at its absolute, absolute maximum when you put that boat in that start bucket. You, I have never experienced a feeling like it and it's an incredible feeling that now I'm able to embrace. But Early on, certainly for many years, it was a place of fear for me. Um, it was a place of fear in terms of the uncertainty of thinking, what training has everybody else done? Are they going to be quicker than me? They're younger than me. They're this, they're that, the other. All of these external uncertain environment um, things that I was putting onto myself at the start bucket. What would, I, what would I say if I didn't win? What would this happen? What would that happen? And, and social media as well is a huge part of that in terms of what you're going to post, what you're going to say and all of this. But it's an incredibly uncertain environment. And really what I found and what I found later on, certainly in the last 12 to 18 months about racing, is really the enjoyment of it. And, and I work with my coach on putting myself into that environment on an ongoing basis. The onus there really is putting myself. So I put myself into that position. I, I put myself into that position of fear because I know that I can compete and that I know that I'm good enough to compete. And I, I know that I can get through that process and deliver the best race that I can now but certainly up to the Rio selection and a couple of races after that, I was petrified in that start gate. And within the first 10 strokes, um, you're hanging on for dear life. Whereas now I know each point of, of, of that environment is going to be, is going to kick on to the next level. And the pain that you feel towards the end of the race is something now that I feel that I enjoy and that I'm very, open and honest with myself that I've taken myself to that place and now it's time for me to now push on and 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 I certainly apply myself in that that stressful situation very very differently to how I did before I think with with uncertainty obviously it's a lot about what could potentially happen next um there's a lot of fear there's a lot of worry and there's a lot of anxiety and that that pictures it looks like a stage photo but it wasn't somebody took it and that was after my my Rio selection with Dave Battershell, the guy that actually um, initially called me to become an athlete. And, and at that point, I really didn't know what was going to happen. I was, I guess, worried about the future. But based on the fact that I didn't perform to the best of my ability, I did really feel that there would be some good stuff coming next and I could work on it. And a lot of that was around my mental capacity to be able to deal with the stressful situation of racing. Um, 
a few months um, after this, I continued to train with the team and, and, and get them to the best place that they could to go off to Rio. And they all went off to Rio and, and, and had a good race. Um, and, um, and then it was really to think, right, okay, Tokyo, it's four years away. What, what do I do? And, and I decided to move away from the Great Britain set off back to, back to the UK. My mum was poorly with cancer and then moved into another very uncertain stage in my life. My mother passed away, um, as a lad with a disability and, and, and a lad that lost his father very young at the age of 13. Um, my mother had always been somebody that, that had completely supported me emotionally, financially, you know, right up until the day that, that she passed away. She was a huge part of my life. And, and to think that she would be gone was, was unthinkable really and, and incredibly uncertain. But as mum would have always said, you know, everything happens for a reason. And, 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 I, and I carried on that year, but I, I didn't, I didn't carry on doing the training like I did before. I just started to enjoy the training and look at it from, from, um, from a perspective of really ticking over and keeping fit. And I went that September, mum passed away in June. And in September, I went to the national championships and I hadn't really done any major training for about three months. The lad to the right of me there is a guy called Johnny Young, who I hadn't beaten for for two years and I went into that race and my face in that picture says it all really I, I, just with complete um looking forward looking forward to racing looking forward to seeing everyone there was no pressure on me on the race um and I cut and I got a silver medal in the national championships and I hadn't really done much training that year because of mum's cancer and um that just showed me really that the uncertain environment that I'd created in my mind was false I'd created it. It wasn't as I thought it. It was a fun environment. It was something that I enjoyed doing. It was something that I was good at. And I delivered the best performance that I had done for like four years in that race. So that, that spoke volumes to me. And I then went off to Australia in the winter of that year, had another season race really well. And then we were moving into 2020, the year prior to the um, the year of the Paralympics. So off to Australia for three months, I went training with these Olympians and Paralympians. It was an incredible achievement, something that I really, really enjoyed. And then on the 22nd of March, I headed back to England. COVID in Australia had been sort of punted around the media a bit, but it was all really just about people panic buying loo rolls. There wasn't any sort of major talk on the, on the, um, on the pandemic as it was in the UK and people were messaging me saying, oh, you're going to think it's really weird when you come home. And then when I got back within a day, we were on lockdown. I got a brief chance. I'd been away for three months. We got a brief chance to see my family on the Sunday. And then on the Monday, Boris imposed a, a lockdown on us for three months. Now for somebody that can potentially suffer with mental health issues, the thought of me being on my own for three months without being able to train or go to the gym or anything like that was, pretty frightening initially um but I knew that I needed to adapt and I needed to adapt quickly so I um a friend of mine runs a fruit and veg shop um not far from me um all of the talks that I had had planned for when I got back from Australia were cancelled because everybody was at home um we couldn't didn't have time to convert them to zoom at that point so I was left with no work no ability to train on the rivers no gyms open or anything. So I got on my good old bike. Um, used to cycle to Godham in at half five every morning, unpack the veg off the van and then go back and get my car. And I started up a little veg round, which sort of got me out of the house as a key worker and, and did some good in the community as well. And that was a great example to me of being, being able to adapt in, a, in an uncertain environment very, very quickly. You know, I knew that the alternative for me was just to sit here and fester and worry about whether the Paralympics was going to happen or not. Sure as hell, within th about three or four weeks, um, the Olympic Committee, Paralympic Committee made the decision to cancel Tokyo. So at this point, another layer of fear came across me really, you know, I, I've been doing this now for seven years. Tokyo was going to be the chance for me to make the Paralympics. And then I was looking to retire after that. 
now potentially with this being cancelled and the chance of it happening next year isn't guaranteed by any means you know my entire Paralympic dream could be over that could be it you know by the time Paris comes I'll be 52 um, competing against guys in their early 20s I mean there's nothing, nothing to say you know never say never but it was a, a huge thing for me to think well actually Christ you know this this could happen um, and it could all be over and what have, what has it all been for you know and that was pretty worrying for a couple of weeks but again I saw it as an opportunity for me to take a step back from training for a couple of months. I'd trained solidly pretty much bar mum's year when she was poorly to, um, you know, 16 times a week in six days for the last seven years. So I changed my program to more of a, a well-being, a physical and mental well-being program. Um, I still canoed through the entire summer, um, but I used to do a lot of cycling a lot of yoga um, and really do a lot of the mindfulness stuff. And I saw training 16 times a week really tires you out um, and it tires you out mentally as well. So I saw it as an opportunity for me to not be as tired mentally, take some time for myself and then do some learning. And that's really where I met a woman that I've been working with called Karen Adams, which we worked a lot on my, um my inner thoughts and and we'll talk at the end of this presentation about how I met Drew and something that Drew saw in me when we first met was something that I was very critical of myself and the work that I did with the Karen enabled me to quieten my inner mind and, and enable me to stop conflicting with myself and and there's a whole other presentation around that but the easiest way for me to describe it to you is that I was always conflicting with myself, which then meant, meant me feel that made me feel that I wasn't good enough. Um, that would then breed anxiety. And we did some incredible work through the summer and it's been really, really worthwhile. So I've had a, a great summer, um, albeit the Paralympics hasn't happened. I've learned a lot and I will and am training now and will continue to train heading into our national championships, which is when our season starts this year in April. Um, so really um everything does happen for a reason you know if the pandemic hadn't happened i wouldn't have had the time to be able to take to do the really really valuable work on my mental health with karen this year so for me that's what's happened that's what the shift has been this year it has been the best year of my life mentally that i've ever had i feel differently about myself more than i ever have done and for me it's also been the most uncertain year of my life. So when you are faced with things that are or that appear very, very uncertain when they first come into your mind, use it as an opportunity to think, well, OK, why is this happening for me? What, what's it bringing me? What am I going to learn from this? Because I spent my entire life thinking, poor me, poor me, poor me, whether that was my feet, my disability, losing my dad. Uh, you know, the, the, all of the things that I used to think, it was always, why me? It always happens to me. And work that I did with Karen has enabled me to think, well, actually, it's not why me, it's for me. And then when, once you start to think about that, whatever situation I now have in my life, I think, right, this is now an opportunity for me to learn. You know, there's some, however hard it is, you know, breakups of relationships, personal problems, health issues, anything like that. There is always, and I promise you this, if you start to look at your mindset in a different way, there is always a way to get a positive outcome out of a, what is initially you would perceive to be a difficult situation. When I met Drew first, we talked a lot about what my success code was. So what made me get up every morning and go training from being a from being in corporate sales to becoming an athlete, you know, in the middle of January when it's pouring down with rain and it's one degree and it's dark and everybody else is all tucked up in bed or having a cup of tea, having a chat with their family in the morning, you know, what was it that made me get up? And certainly this year has enabled me to structure my learning into the business that I have, Zenval, but to what Drew also called, which is the success code. And I've just got a little slide to run through with you now on, on, on how I see it in terms of uncertainty and what my success code is around uncertainty. So we're faced with a situation um, 
that situation in our mind perceives uncertain. We're not sure about the outcome. That will initially breed fear. That fear is based on past experiences. So we will always apply a situation to something in our mind. And this is probably something that for the majority of us happens subconsciously, subconsciously but we will base our understanding of a situation on what, what's happened to us in the past. That can breed anxiety, certainly if it was uncertain and it was something that went wrong for us in the past. The next stage of that is we're scared of failing. You know, the fear of failure is huge um, for a lot of us and, and it can actually stop us performing in some situations as it did with me in the boat. Um, and then really what then people would think of us if we do fail, you know. Um, so they're big parts of it. Really now, and, and I'm so pleased that I've done this work, I see this now as an opportunity really. So why is, it's not the why, you know, it's to learn from each situation that's brought to us in an uncertain environment. It's really to look at the subject of, of what's being brought to us. So if it's a work situation, it's something that we don't know, or if it's an individual, a difficult relationship that we're having at work or at home or whatever, really look at the subject itself. Um, and for me, that was very much based around my, my, my initial, or my, my, sorry, my internal fears. And then really to look at the growth and the opportunity for growth in this. So believe me, when you deal with a difficult situation, you, if you learn and use this sort of structure, a way to be able to deal with that difficult situation, the next time that uncertain situation comes up, that first column that you're looking at there on the left, the anxiety experiences, failure and thing, that, that dissipates because you go straight into phase two, you go straight into the right, I want to learn from this. And that's fantastic once you get that. You need to create the right environment around you. And this is something that Drew said to me when I first, on one of the two of the first meetings that I had with Drew, um, was that your life walks at the pace of the five people that are closest to you. And with me, with sport, I, 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 been lucky enough to be able to create a team of people around me to get me to where I want to be but I've now also applied that to my um, my personal life and my life in general really and I'm very conscious of the people that are around me and, and I now have people around me in my life that I have complete trust over um, and also I, I value their opinions and everything so I, I've been very lucky to be able to create this this team of people around me and never be afraid to ask any questions um, and really to look at setting in some time frames around this this situation that you're in and how you're successfully going to be able to um, to achieve what you need to achieve and then really at the end you've got the outcome but if you've done the majority of the work that we're talking about here then the onus on the, this successful outcome that we always felt that we needed you know whether that's the promotion the, the new car the big house or whatever for me winning the race or anything like that becomes there becomes a little less pressure or focused around this area because really for me as we look at that 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 screen in front of us there the most important part of that is the middle column the opportunity it's the learning so whatever the outcome that will always be with you, that learning, the, the thing that you've learned. And it may be, if the outcome isn't quite what you thought it might be, the next time you get to this situation, the outcome might be slightly different again, but you'll always learn and you'll always remember what you've learned the last time. And that's really my, my success code to dealing with uncertainty. And throughout this incredibly... <laughs> What has been a roller coaster uh, of uncertainty for me becoming a high performing athlete. I can sit there now and that picture's in my kitchen and look at all the wonderful medals that I've won and races that I've won. And the, the one in the middle there being the, the, the one where I represented my country and got a bronze medal in the World Championship, in the World um, Cup in Duisburg in, in 2015. So, amidst all of this confusion and frustration and anxiety and uncertainty, um, that I saw for so many years, um, I still managed to perform. Um, 
And what I'm really, really excited about now is what I've learned in this incredibly difficult year that we've all had, applying that to when I sit in that boat um, in 2021 at the national championships to become um, as close to British champion as I can be and, and or to be British champion. But I know now from what I've learned this year is that the British champion part isn't necessarily the relevant outcome. The relevant outcome is me finally being able to be in a position where I know that I can deliver the best race that I've ever delivered based on all the work that I've done up to now. So there's my chat. I'm going to now stop um, sharing my screen and I'm going to hand over to Drew. So I met Drew at a sporting dinner um, where I was talking about three years ago and we sat on the same table after I spoke. Drew loved the story, um, saw it as a very real story. I, I, I knew of Drew because Drew was, um, is, is, um, is known for, aside to his, his great leadership work, for his work on the TV show, Educating Greater Manchester and, and, and I, asked him we, we agreed that we'd catch up and have some lunch and then once we had the lunch I asked Drew if he'd mentor me and I've been lucky enough for Drew to mentor me Drew's become a part of the Zenvale community he's incredibly knowledgeable knowledgeable about all things um, leadership mental resilience what we're going to talk about now too um, in terms of an, um, uncertain dealing with uncertainty and the power of that so I'll hand over to Drew now. Thank you very much for listening. And over to you, Mr. Povey. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, morning, everyone. Just to make sure you can hear me, give us a thumbs up if you can hear me. No one's given me the bird, which is always a good start to a talk, of course. And I was quite excited, actually, when uh, I realised it was 11s. I thought, well, this is going to be good. We're all going to sit around and we're going to have some cake. And then I got an email through about the three W's and I thought, well, let's cook that up. So I went with a black coffee and a water and we'll just get in the mixer. Tim, thanks for, for that introduction. Um, what we're going to be talking about over the next few minutes, uh, Tim's story is great. I like, I've heard that so many times and I still love it. There's still so much to take from it every time um, I hear it. And, and I, I'm hopefully going to pick up some of that stuff in it. But the first thing I've got to say is what a year 2020 has been. I mean, think back to kind of like New Year's Eve when we were all there going hopes and dreams for 2020, new decade, it's going to be amazing. And we all had these things we wanted to achieve. And actually what's interesting, at the end of 2020, we're all kind of going, thank goodness for everything that I've got. It's been a really interesting, I think, rather than kind of going for something else and wanting bigger and better, we've ended up kind of with this whole attitude of gratitude, or at least we damn well should have uh, for the things that we've been through. And I've done, oh gosh, about 210 of these kind of things now um, online, chats with people. Uh, that has ranged from all sectors, from, from uh, the Welsh Rugby Union and, and elite level sport, the police, I do a lot with the police, the NHS, of course, I still do a little bits and bobs in education and with some of the biggest companies in the world. And I say this not to impress you, but to impress upon you some of the stuff that I'm gonna go through that I think it's usually relevant. I'll be talking about a couple of levels here. I'll be talking about you personally as a person, because that is huge for us. And it's very much in line with the topic you're talking about, but also you as a leader as well. And if you're going, well, I don't really lead anyone. My argument is, yes, you do because John Maxwell's quote on leadership for me is the best quote in the world. Leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. So if you have influence over someone or something, you're a leader. So I think I want to talk on, on those two terms. And, and over the last eight or nine months, I very often get asked on podcasts or webinars or whatever it's been, uh, how would I describe 2020? And without swearing, I think the sentence I would use to describe it would be every emotion except boredom. And if you think about it, it's got to be true, hasn't it? We've had ups, we've had downs, we've had in the middle, but I don't think there's been many people go, oh, I'm just bored, unless you're getting sick and tired of Netflix. Um, the vast majority of the time, we have had a lot of different emotions. But that's looking in the rearview mirror about where we've been. Let's look at the future. And I read a lot on leadership. I read for an hour a day. I describe myself as a leadership geek in the most um, positive of terms, I think. And... As we look through the windscreen at the future, the one word that keeps coming up is that word that we're looking at today, the word uncertainty. Like nobody really knows. 
the vaccines come out, fantastic. When I'm 43, I know I look about 53, but I genuinely I'm 43. And I'm probably not going to get the vaccine until 2025, the way it's going. And I'm going to have half a jab and then three weeks later, another jab. And then four weeks later after that, I might be all right. And that's only 90%. So nobody really knows what's going to happen in the future. I want to look at this word uncertainty. So I want to get you on the chat. Fantastic. So get, you, get your fingers ready. So what I want you to do on the chat, everybody get in, in the mix with this, if that's all right. When you see this word, uncertainty, apologies for my handwriting. I know it's a bit of a shocker. When you see the word uncertainty, what's the first thing that pops in your head? So when you see the word uncertainty, what's the word or what's the first thing that pops in your head? Get it on the chat. Go for it. There's no right or wrong. It's whatever it means to you. So logie has got help. I don't know whether he's turned his camera off. So whether he actually needs help or whether uncertainty means help, I'm not quite sure. Change, negative, anxious, can't plan, change, worry. Another one for worry. Anxiety. Thanks, Pam. Lots of different words. They're all lodges back. That means you don't need help, do you, Tim? I was meaning help as in either, either to help myself through this point. All ah, right. OK, sorry. Yeah, I was wondering whether we needed to send someone around for you. <laughs> um, so, OK, so when you look at the term uncertainty, let's look at the words we've got down there. And the first human response to uncertainty is pretty negative. Even some of the words that we've got around there, some people there are saying um, challenging, anxiety, worry, worry, can't plan, anxious, negative. The words are negative. And for us as individuals and the people around us, if we're living in an uncertain world, and it's definitely fair to say, the only thing we can be certain about is the fact that we're living in an uncertain world, the first initial response is negative. And I think that's, that's pretty much correct. But then I want to dig into it. So I was quite interested in this around probably April, May time when we were really uncertain about what was going to happen. We were trying to unlock, but we couldn't unlock. And the government was kind of flip flopping every day on what we were going to do. I, can't, I started to read on uncertainty and I came across what I'm going to refer to as three uncertainty dynamics. So the initial human response is negative. Then I want to just very quickly touch over three things. The first one is that idea of worry. Tim mentioned it in his talk and Nick King's mentioned it on here. People are going to worry in times of uncertainty. Now then I have these little brain rants as you get into probably know me, you can well imagine it like five in the morning. I'm going, well, what is worry? And it actually, the word worry comes from the Greek word, which means divided mind. Now, I thought that was brilliant because if you think about what worry does, it does split your attention from what you probably should be focusing on to something else. It literally does divide your mind. If you're anything like me, I've got three boys, three, three, uh, well, two of the three are teenagers. Imagine the hormone hot house that we live in here. But when I'm with my family, I'm very often thinking about work, dividing my mind and worrying about what's happening over here. And when I'm in work, I end up worrying about what's happening with my family and I'm spending enough time there. It literally does divide your mind. So that's the first thing we've got to say about worry. But the old adage about worry is an absolute cracker, which is worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you very far. And it's true. Um, a lot of people have worried. I've not come across anybody this year that said, you know what, Drew, throughout 2020, I've not worried once about anything. I haven't worried. Most people have worried. In, like, in, in March, we all thought it was going to wipe the human race out. We thought we were all goners, didn't we? If we're being honest, like we didn't know where this was going to go. So people have worried. But what is it we're worried about? And the more I was reading on this, the more I started to realise that we worry about what we might lose. Health, status, job, house. Now, why is it we would worry about what we might lose? Well, this is an evolutionary component. I won't go into too much detail there, but we are in survival mode all the time and we worry about the thing that might take us down. And what's interesting about a loss is that according to Brian Tracy, a loss has two and a half times the emotional impact on us that a gain has. And think about it, it's so true. When we lose something, it hits us harder than a gain. You know, like when you lose 20 quid, 
and you spend a ridiculous amount of time trying to find the 20 quid. You're going everywhere. Where's that damn 20 quid? Where is it? You're almost at the point where you're going to get a knife out and slash your sofa up to see if it's behind your sofa just to find the 20 quid. What happens when you actually find 20 quid you didn't know you had in your purse, your wallet, or you know that little jeans pocket? And you go, oh, 20 quid, move on. The gain is not as big as a loss. So we're worried about what we might lose. That's uncertainty dynamic number one. Uncertainty dynamic number two, which Nick has, uh, sorry, which uh, Tim has already mentioned, is this idea of fear. People have been fearful this year. But again, let's dig beneath the surface of fear. What is it we're fearing? Well, a lot of people talk about the fear of failure. This has been written about by loads of um, authors like Susan Jeffers, Feel the Fear, Do It Anyway, John Maxwell, Fail Forward. We, we fear failure. So I was, I've was i talked about this for years and years. Okay, people are fearing failing at what? At life, maybe. At being able to exist, maybe. Failing at their job because it's dramatically different, maybe. And I've talked about this, as I said a moment ago, for so many years. Until about eight months ago, I was listening to a podcast by a, by a guy called Seth Godin. And he's a marketeer, but he's written a lot about leadership. And he was doing this uh, podcast and he was saying, people think we fear failure. And I was going, well, yeah, I've been talking about that. And quite frankly, Seth, I've made a bit of a career out of it. So don't, don't cock this up for me. And he said, I don't think it's the failure that we fear. And I'm thinking, well, what is it then? And then he goes, it's not, the, it's not the fear of failure. It's fear of the criticism that's connected to the failure. And this was like early morning. And I've got, this is totally true. I'm walking my dog in the middle of nowhere, like half five in the morning. I've got a pair of wellies on and a pair of shorts and this black coat on and it's chucking it down. Not a good look, I know, but it's just how I roll in the morning. And I'm there and I've had this moment where I'm thinking to myself, oh my goodness, he's right. And his point was, as human beings, we know we're going to fail. How do you learn to walk? Fall over. How do you learn to ride a bike? You fall off the damn thing. We know we're going to fail. It's not the failure, it's the criticism that's connected to the failure that we have a problem with. I thought it was genius. I love it. I wanted to share it with you today. Good mate of mine, the sumo guy. Some people might have come across him. He's not a sumo wrestler. Paul McGee, Pam, you know him. He's a really good mate of mine. He lives up the road here where I live in the People's Republic of Warrington. And we're really good mates. And I was telling him about this. I said, hey, I said, I've got this thing here, Seth Godin. It's not the fear of failure, fear of criticism. And he went, you know what, Drew, you bang on. And it's a true story. He said, I cannot park my car to save my life. And I'm like, right. And he said, when I go out with my family for a meal, he said, I will not park my car because I know I'm going to cock it up. And because I'm going to cock it up, they're going to laugh at me like for ages and criticize me. So he said, I will drop my family at the restaurant. I will drive five miles out of the way to completely inconvenience myself to find a spot where there is nobody around, even though I know I'm going to fail in the parking of it. I don't want the criticism that goes with it. So I think it's a really good point. So uncertainty dynamic number one, we worry about loss. Uncertainty dynamic number two is we fear failure or probably more accurately the criticism that's connected to it. Again, this is for us as individuals, us as leaders. Uncertainty dynamic number three is, I'm going to do a bit of art here, so I apologise in advance. <laughs> if this here is our comfort zone, here we all are in 2020. Oh, uh, put a bit of hair on it. I'll make it kind of non-gender specific so I don't offend anybody in the world, but we are well and truly outside of our comfort zone. There is nobody at any point this year has said to me, Drew, everything's remained the same for me this year. I've just carried on. It's just been normal. It's, it's all been tickety-boo and life's just as it was in 2019. Nobody's saying that because we all feel out of our comfort zone. So we're living in an uncertain world. First initial human response for us and the people we lead and we work with is going to be negative. Then we have to understand that people are worried, worried about what they might lose, status, health, whatever. And people are fearing the failure or is it the criticism connected to the failure? And everybody's feeling out the comfort zone. And I think they will for some time being. 
Now, he might be sitting there going, Drew, this is 11s. We've come on to have a bit of a laugh. Tim's given us a motivational story. And to be quite honest, you're depressing us. So um, if you could give us something of value that stops me um, wanting to, like, go to bed for the rest of the day and pull the doobie over my head, that would be fantastic. I am going to change this around a little bit because I do. I do hope that we can reframe this. Tim mentioned before, the mindset is powerful, it is. So how can we take the negative onto a positive? Let's try and get into that now. I'm gonna give you three uncertainty statements, okay? These are three uncertainty statements. Uncertainty statement, these are the positives. Uncertainty statement number one, uncertainty is where innovation lives. I'll say it again. Uncertainty is where innovation lives. So let's put our little innovation over here. What do we mean by that? Nothing that ever came as a great innovation. Anybody that did anything incredible and shifted the needle and was brilliant at something, could that have come from a place of certainty? It just can't. It must have been unpredictable. To quote Seth Godin again, I love this quote, and it's very, very sad that I've learned it, but I just think it's really powerful. You can't become remarkable by following someone else's remarkable because that thing is already taken. Therefore, it's no longer remarkable. I know it's not the most pithy quote you're ever going to come across, and it's a bit wordy, but it's a great one. You can't become remarkable by following someone else's remarkable because that thing is now taken. Therefore, it's no longer remarkable. Anything great in life has come from a place of uncertainty. This is a time we can innovate. This is a time when we can shift the needle. This is the time when we can do things differently and work absolutely. In March, I was doing all my talks at the beginning of March in person. I love people. I love being around the energy of people. And suddenly I was looking at a camera on a screen. And I've had to work really hard to learn how to present on screen. I was awful to begin with because I was trying to do it as I was in person. You might be looking at me now thinking you need to put a bit more work in, Drew, because to be quite frank, this is bloody awful. But I have worked genuinely. I've worked on it. And, and we innovate because we're pushed to innovate in a place of uncertainty. I've spent more time with my wife and kids, which I think they've enjoyed during the last eight months than I have probably for the last eight years. I reckon my lads are close to calling me dad again instead of Drew. Because we've spent more time together, there's been time to do things differently in this world. This is a time of innovation. Think Steve Jobs, right? Great story this to exemplify this. When he went back to Apple in 1996, they were knackered. They made him CEO in 1997, crowded computer market. Apple were way below everyone else. You can imagine the senior team meeting, can't you? They all come in around a big table and Steve Jobs goes, guys, I've got it. We're going to do this thing called an iPod. And they're like, what the hell's an iPod, Steve? And he's like, God, it's this MP3 player. And they're going to go, whoa, 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 Steve. Dell have tried that down the road in Silicon Valley. It doesn't work. And he said, well, why doesn't it work? And he said, well, no one can be bothered getting the CDs, downloading it onto the PC, then downloading that onto the MP3 player. No one can be bothered. Great place of uncertainty. And that's when he came up with the response. Well, I've already thought about that. I'm going to create this thing called iTunes. And the rest of the music industry, of course, is history. You see, in that time of uncertainty, he innovated. And he innovated again. Then 2003, anyone know on chat what he came out with in 2003? What did Apple produce in 2003? Anyone know? Get on the old chat. It's the iPhone, correct, Nick? Well done, well done, well done. iPhone, here's the next question for you. What was the best-selling phone in 2003? Anyone know? The best-selling phone. Yes, good iPhone there, Chris. Good on you. Wasn't a Nokia. Wasn't a Nokia. Yes, it was the Motorola. Tim, it was the Motorola. You've heard this talk before. You can't get involved. Bloody cheating. Detention for you after, after class. It is. It was, yeah, it was a Motorola. Do you remember the Motorola flip phone from 24, Jack Bauer? We all thought we were Jack Bauer and bought one. We had the ringtone. Remember, da -da -da -da, the ringtone, or is that just me? Looking at your faces, it was just me. Move on quick, Drew. There's a, a serious tumbleweed moment happening online. 
move on. There's a bell tolling in the corner, pal. Yes, it was. It was that. And, and what was interesting was Steve Jobs said, I want to create this thing where actually there's some computer functionality on a phone. So it's not just a phone. You've got some computer functionality on it. And Motorola, best selling phone at the time, made the comment, who will ever want data on their phone? Imagine someone saying that 2003, a bit like when Blockbuster said to Netflix, we don't want to buy you for next to nothing because it's all about the DVDs. No one's going to online stream. True stories. So this is the time when we can innovate. Next one I want to talk about. Next uncertainty statement to get a bit more positive. Uncertainty is where we learn and grow towards our potential. So I'll put down here, learn and grow. Think about this for a second. This has been a time when we've learned so much about ourselves, so much about people that we, we work with our family. This has been a time of learning and growth. Uncertainty always is. And actually, it's a time when we can push towards our potential. Here's a story for this one. Who's Roger Bannister? Or who was Roger Bannister? Anyone know? And he's not the man that created rails for stairs. Yes, he was the guy who did the four minute mile, correct? Brilliant. Yeah, the four minute mile guy. Now, Roger Bannister, at the time, this was post-war, rationing was around, people hadn't been coached properly. The doctors, the medics, were saying it was physiologically, biologically, and psychologically impossible to run a sub-four-minute mile. Yes, chariot of fire, well done, Nick. And at the time, people were saying, you can't do it, you can't do it, you can't do it. But of course, in that place of uncertainty, Roger Bannister learned and grew towards his potential and he did the sub four minute mile. And a lot of people say the rest is history. That's the end of the story. In fact, it isn't. Because within three weeks of Roger Bannister doing it, that uncertain thing then became certain. And guess what? Another six people did it within three weeks. So that's the biggest part of the story. This is a time when we will learn and grow about ourselves and those around us. And we can push the needle towards our potential. Final point I want to make before I look to close. Uncert in fact, I'm going to put a caveat on this before I start this, because there will be a there'll be a, a potential that you'll want to reach through the screen and throttle me when I put this up, but please bear with me. Uncertainty is exhilarating. Now, you might think to yourself, Drew, I can think of uh, many words to describe to 2020 and exhilarating is not one of them. But just bear with me on this. Why on earth would anybody want to tie a big elastic band around their ankle and jump off a bridge or out of a plane or off a cliff or off something they have no right doing so? That, for me, is just utter madness that and jumping out of a plane and all those things if you like adventure travel i'm pleased for you but that for me is incredibly uncertain and i don't care what the stats say it is going to give me ibs at a completely different level and it's that level of exhilaration that i'm talking about here uncertain times are exhilarating a lot of my work in fact most of my work has been done in elite sport and i can tell you now the top level athletes like tim they don't want to go into a competition where they, they win it by a country mile. Or they don't want to batter a rugby team by 60 nil. They don't want to win 7 nil in football. The best athletes, they want to play on the highest level occasions in those big games. It's that test. It's that, it's that level of exhilaration of putting yourself up there and not quite knowing what's going to happen but it's going to be exciting and exhilarating. So I hope I've managed to give you a balance between the two. A quick recap, and then I've got one point to finish on. We are living in an uncertain world. And by the way, 2021, I don't think it's going to be much different. And the first initial human response for us and those around us, our family members, our colleagues, is going to be a negative one. And then the more we dig into it, people are worried about what they might lose. People are fearful about failure or the criticism, and people do feel out the comfort zone. So it could look like a negative picture. However, let's flip it. Uncertainty is where innovation lives. Any great innovations come from a place of uncertainty. 
And I've seen some great examples of that. Some of the tech companies I'm working with. I was on a call with a CEO this morning from a tech company. Some of the innovations they're coming out with are absolutely fabulous. We're finding different and better ways of doing things. Same in education, same in the police, same in the NHS. There's some real positives here. Innovation, uh, sorry, uncertainty is where we learn and grow. It's about us learning about ourselves and going to the next level. And uncertainty is exhilarating if it's framed correctly. I'm going to finish with a point Tim made. The mindset for this matters. In a place of uncertainty, you're going to have one of two mindsets. Mindset number one is what I refer to as the obstacle mindset. You just look at all the problems. Well, we can't do it the way we used to. How are we going to deal with this? How do we overcome that? How do we hurdle this? How do we jump that? And then the other one, the other mindset we could have is the opportunity mindset. Okay, so what could we do? Where could we go? What else is available to us? And could we completely shift our business or the way we operate in our business to new levels? That's what I've seen Tim do in his life. He has absolutely gone from some really difficult places of uncertainty and used them to his advantage. It can be a competitive advantage. And I'm not suggesting you could just go into someone who's in a difficult moment and say, hey, we can innovate, learn and grow. And this is really exhilarating because they'll just punch you square in the face. But what I think we can do is work on the slowly getting the mindset going from, hey, is this about the obstacles or is it about the opportunities? And actually, what could we do? Never underestimate the power of humans. We do adapt. We do it brilliantly well. And that's why we're still on the earth. And that's why we're still the most dominant species on the earth, because we are brilliant at adapting. And on that note, I'm going to shut my mouth and hand back to Mr. Lodge. Tim, over to you. That was fantastic, Drew. And I was a bit conscious when I was answering the questions, but I didn't remember most of the answers apart from the Motorola Razor one. So um, I knew that one because that was a phone that changed my life. We all felt really important when we could flip our phones, couldn't we? So remember it well. <laughs> but I, <clears throat> I think um, really back to you in a, in a sec, Chris. But I mean, I think you'll all agree, Drew has a fantastic way of explaining things and, and he's certainly been a huge influence in the term you know in my change over the last couple of years since I've met him so I'd strongly urge now we've got a bit of time um, I know we're nearly at the hour but I'm sure if, if Drew's fine just for a few more minutes if you know you can talk to me and send me emails till you're blue in the face but you've got the opportunity to talk to somebody that's really very very good at what he does so I'm going to shut up and ask as many questions as you'd, um, as you'd like and I know Chris being Chris he's probably got about 10 already lined up to ask you anyway so, um, well, yeah I'm, I'm gonna shut up and let you talk that was brilliant uh, Drew really good um, and um, it's interesting because we've done a number of these sessions um, and uh, and uh, the innovation piece we, we've uh, in, in our working environment uh, certainly we, you know, in, in the CICMQ team have had to change fundamentally what we do. Our, ba our Basically, our business is sitting next to people discussing how they do their work to gain accreditation, talking in large groups, running workshops with full of people all around the world, actually. Um, and we've had to turn, we've had to literally, literally overnight um, say that, well, we can't do that anymore. Uh, so we've now, so what we had to do was to create um, everything online we've had to change our assessments to online we've done our training we've changed that to online we've changed all of the the workshops all my client work is now completely online workshops with with um with with, in, with in, innovative tools and shared whiteboards and stuff um like the one behind you but obviously digitally so we've got lots of people putting stuff on whiteboards and things so we've had to fundamentally change and it has been um absolutely it has been amazing um it's also been a worry as well because obviously you know revenues and stuff has changed and we, we you know, there was times when we all worried about where, where we were going to go and I know there's a number of people on this call you know that have had um, issues with their jobs and their roles and things like that they've left their previous organizations etc so it's been a very challenging time for a lot of us um, and I love the I love the, the you know moving from the three to the, the exhilaration learn and grow and innovate and we've certainly had to innovate I think I've learned something. Um, 
and 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 it's been exhilarating because it's kind of been scary. It's like being on the front seat of the of the didn't Disney ride, and you think, Jesus, why am I sitting here? Right, and then suddenly it off it goes. Now we we, we are we're all almost very much up to time. So has anybody got any questions? You can come off mute and ask the questions. We are still recording. If if you in case you're wondering, so um be, be um but, so just bear that in mind. Uh, anybody got any questions questions they want to ask? I'll ask one of I'll ask one of Drew because I don't think anyone's yeah. asking me asking just, just a, one for me Drew you know that that exhilarating feeling that initial feeling when something comes in and you're like right what's happening here you know that can you know your heart rate increases you can feel hot you can feel bothered you can feel closed in all of these things that people term as anxiety how do you look to change that physical feeling within your body into a positive because sometimes it can become quite physically overwhelming yeah and what do you do in your day-to-day -day life to make sure that situations like that are lessened and dissipated more yeah i mean it's not you know it's you can do a session like that and everyone can go you know we can group hug or virtual group hug high five fist bump chest bump whatever that might be a bit far fetch but you know there's lots of things you can do and go do a session like that and go yeah but how do you actually manage it on a day-to-day -day basis like most things in life i think everything comes back to self-awareness and it's being able to then the daniel goldman stuff the emotional intelligence you go from self-awareness to self-management and you know two points on this breathing exercises are massive and i, I once said on senator conference you know how i deal with that is breathing yeah, <laughs> people are like that's uh, really helpful, Drew. You must have been up all night thinking of that. <laughs> uh, that's not exactly a brain buster. Um, but the 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 benefits of nasal breathing. So we're using this a lot in sport at the moment. Nasal breathing is big. We've become um, uh, uh, there's a really good book out called Breath, which talks about this. We become a world of mouth breathers. Nasal breathing's brilliant for many reasons, but it hits something called a vagus nerve, which calms yeah. down the parasympathetic nervous system. So yeah. there is a self-management around the physical side. There is another thing out there, a bank of research, which not many people have heard of called emo diversity, which means like we basically go our emotions. I feel good or I feel bad. And that's it. We don't actually bore into what are these emotions that I'm feeling? Mm. We just get the feeling and we just either push it away or we go towards it. But actually, what is it telling us? Mm. And sometimes a little bit of nerves and then we start to feel bad. It's not a bad thing, actually. It's how we frame that. It's the explanatory style you and I often talk about, the Martin Seligman thing. So I think there's actually a physical thing we can do with the breathing. But I think we have to really sit back and go, what's going on here? Why am I feeling what I'm feeling? Or what is it that I'm actually feeling? And, and explore that a little bit. And if you just Google emo diversity, you'll see there's a lot of different labels for the feelings that we have. I think it comes from um, a university in Texas where the bank of research is from. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm going to stop the recording now. Um, so, so and the, but we'll carry on afterwards. Thanks very much indeed, Drew. Brilliant. I really enjoyed that. Thanks ever so much for, for taking time out to talk to all of us. Um, as I said, I'll put this on, on the YouTube channel and I'll also send it to you as well. So I'm just going to stop recording now. And we can carry on afterwards. OK, so thanks very much indeed.